Oh, praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. It's a beautiful day that the Lord has made. My name is Anthony Njagi Waweru, and uh, I am going to be sharing with us on the famine uh, from the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. And before we share, I want us to pray. Father, we thank you for this new day, for your goodness and your grace and your love and kindness. Thank you for helping us to see this day. Thank you for the good plans you have for us to give us a future and a hope. Thank you, Lord, for in this season, Lord, your word is not scarce. We can still access your word. Lord, even with the talk of lockdown and quarantine, your word is not quarantined, your word is not under lockdown. Your word is spreading to the utmost parts of the world. And we thank you, Lord, even at this time you've helped us to be more effective in outreach. And Lord, we thank you for you have given us the tools we need to continue sharing your word and broadcasting it to many. Lord, as we share today, we pray for clarity. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, your word will speak to us very clearly and that, Lord, you will minister to our very hearts even in this season. In this season of uh, sickness, Lord, we know that you have a word for us. Well, you spoke to people in times of calamities, in times of famine, in times of drought. In times of war, Lord, you spoke to them and you are still speaking to us today. So, Lord, we are open and alert to hear from you. May you speak to us in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, we will go to the text in the book of Second Kings chapter 4. Uh, Second Kings chapter 4 is a chapter that uh, captures three distinct events that happened during the times of Elisha, the prophet of Elijah. And if you remember well, Elijah was a respected prophet, and there was no doubt about the fact that he was a man of God. I mean, the height of his career was when he called together the prophets of Baal to a contest to prove between them and him who actually was having the living God. And so a time came when Elijah had to depart from this earth and he left Elisha, his servant, to continue with the ministry. And a very interesting thing is happening in chapter 4 because there's a confirmation that this was an actual prophet of God. And people acknowledge that this is a man of God. Three distinct events happen in this chapter. The first one is where Elisha helps a poor widow. You remember a widow who came to him and told him that uh, her husband was a member of a group of prophets and he had died, leaving a huge debt for the wife. And indeed, the debtors wanted, the creditors rather, wanted to come and take her sons as slaves in order to repay the debt that the husband owed. The woman cried out to, Eli to Elisha, and Elisha helped her in a miraculous way. You remember that he asked her to bring all the vessels that were available, then he poured out oil into all those vessels. And it came to a time that he asked her, do you still have any other jar that we can put more oil? And they said, there's nothing left. There's not a jar left. The prophet of the Lord now spoke to the woman and told her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. So he distinctly helped her to pay off her debts and also provide for her needs. It's in the same chapter, chapter 4, where we see Elijah make, uh, performing other, Elisha making, uh, performing mother miracles in the same uh, famine season. Uh, we are told that there's a time that he returned to Gilgal and there was a famine in the land. And a group of prophets were seated before him and he said to his servant, put a large pot of fire and make some stew for the rest of the group. And one of the young men went out to the field and gathered herbs and came back with a pocket full of wild gourds. He shredded them in the pot without realizing they were poisonous. They made a stew out of the same. And no sooner had they started taking the stew than they realized that this was actually a poisonous stew. Elisha told them not to worry and bring some flour to him. And when he poured the flour into the stew, the stew ceased from being bitter and they actually enjoyed it. And I'm imagining that that was some very precious to you because this was a time of famine. And probably this was the only meal that they would enjoy for that day. 
So it was a confirmation that this was a man of God that they were dealing with. But where I want us to dwell more on is on the story of the Shunammite woman in the same chapter. One day Elisha went to the town of Shunem. I'm reading from verse 8. A wealthy woman lived there and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops from stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then we'll have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day Elijah came, returned to Shunem, and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elijah said to Gehazi, Tell her we appreciate the kind of concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the command of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, What can we do for her? Gehazi replied, She doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elijah told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, Next year, this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. I want us to pause there briefly. Of course, two great miracles happened to this woman, and we just encountered the first one. The first one is where Elisha asks her, what can we do for you? Can we put in a good word to the king for you? In terms of, Elisha was a man who was known even by the king himself. He was known by the command of the army. If it was in our context in Kenya today, Elisha was a person you'd say has the president's ear. He has President Uhuru's ear. But he also had the ear of General Mwathete, the commander of the army, as it were. And we see a woman who is not interested in what Elisha is offering, which is very unique and very interesting because uh, she it demonstrates one key thing, that she was not doing it with a view to get something in return. This is the first key point about this woman, that she was not doing it to get anything in return. She was doing the right thing because it was the right thing to do. She was serving a man of God because it was the right thing to do. She was not doing it because she was expecting something in return. In fact, the meeting ends without her saying what Elijah can do for her. And how many times do we go to the house of God and serve the men of God with a definite expectation that they will do something in return? How many times do we help others because we know that they are also in a position to help us? How many times do we write flattering posts to other people so that they can notice us? And probably give us some sorts of favor. But this woman was distinct. This woman was unique. This woman was not interested in any favors. She was just doing the right thing. And this is very important about that woman. But the second thing also about this woman is that she was a heart woman. Why do I say that she was a heart woman? When Elijah tells her that you will be having a son at a time like this next year, she says, no, 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 no. Please don't put my hope high. What that means is it's probable, it's possible that this woman had been lied to before. It's probable that some Men of God in quotes had told her that you will get a son. Uh, so many times until she got a defense mechanism and probably felt that these people were taking advantage of her. Of course, we are told that she was a rich woman. I mean, how many people can afford to have a story house and dedicate a room in that a story house for a random stranger? She was a rich woman. She was an affluent woman. And in fact, she confirms to Elisha, as much. She says, my family takes good care of me. 
in terms of we do not lack. So we are looking at a woman who did not want somebody to manipulate her. And she felt that, well, as much as I know that this fellow is a man of God, I also don't want to put my position myself in a position of being manipulated. And Elisha does not insist, but there's a sure sign one year down the line that the woman actually received a child consistent with what the man of God had said. A second miracle happens shortly. One day when her child was older, he went out to help his father who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried out, My head hurts. My head hurts. His father said to one of his servants, Carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home, and his mother held him on her lap. Long story short, the child died. And after the child had died, the first reaction that the woman has is, we need to tell the man of God that the child that came to us through his word has actually died. Then, as soon as Elisha is called back, this is what she says to him in verse 28. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? This is hurting. She now tells, you know, it reminds me of the Garden of Eden where Abraham, uh, Adam rather, is asked about who gave him the apple to eat. Is it? The, no, the fruit, the forbidden fruit. And um, the first thing that he says is, is that it's this woman who you gave me. You know, it shifts responsibility. And we are also looking at this woman and she's saying that, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And the entire said, don't deceive me and get my hopes up. Then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives, and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elijah and told him, the child is still dead. When Elijah arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And he stretched out on him. The child's body began to grow warm again. Elijah walked up. Walked back, and walked back and forth across the room once, then stretched himself out again on the child. This time the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Elisha said, Here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her, in, her, in her arms and carried him downstairs. And brothers and sisters, if there's a, a key lesson that we are learning from this whole story is the power of service. The power of service. This was a woman who served a man of God without expecting anything in return. And what God rewarded her with was something that was beyond her imagination. I mean, in all her imagination, she would not have imagined that Elijah would speak a word that would translate into her getting a child. Even with all her earthly possessions, she says she was well, well uh, provided for by her family. The Lord was able to use the aspect of her service to provide for her something that money could not buy. And did he do it once? No, he did it twice. The power of service. This woman decided to serve the man of God wholeheartedly. And not only the man of God. 
the man of God was coming together with his servant. And we are told that every other time they would come, they knew that was their room. They did not have to knock. They just had to come in and go into their room. That is why even during the time that the child is now dying, Elisha was still around because this is a place that he was frequenting. This was a place that he was coming from time to time. You know, some of us uh, have a tendency of uh, serving people, but we only serve for a season or a time. I mean, I will buy you a bag of rice today, but that's all. Don't expect any other thing from me. We are living in times that uh, people are not even well provided for. Uh, and people are really worried because many businesses have closed down and many people are still having the same expectations from their landlords, still have to pay rent, they still have to feed their children. And as Christians, sometimes we just help people once to ease our conscience. We help people once. I mean, uh, I will give you a thousand today, but please don't come back to me with the same problem. I have given you a thousand, that's all. But we are see, seeing a woman who had decided to serve Elisha for a lifetime. And this should shape our attitude when we are serving the people of God. That we should not only serve for a season so that we can always use that as a reference point. But we should serve and keep on serving. Why is this, why is this important? If this woman had only served Elisha once... The one, the kind of thing we call hit and run. Probably Elisha would still have spoken about her getting a child. And it's true she would have gotten the child. But if she had cut off her service, I'm trying to imagine what would have happened if she now realized that the son that I was given is dead. And I cannot access the servant of God because I only served him once. and That was all. But because of her continued service, you know, she never tired of doing good. The Bible tells us that we should not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we shall reap a good harvest. This is a woman who was not weary in doing good. She did not serve Elisha only for a season and tell her that now we want to renovate the house, man of God. Uh, we feel that she should now look for another place. She decided to serve and keep on serving. That is why the second time she needed a miracle, the man of God was still accessible. Brothers and sisters, this is the rallying call to us today. Can we serve and keep on serving? Right now, the servants of God, uh, many of them, I, I, I work with focus and I know that at a time like this, they, 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 they don't even have a, a sustenance. I mean, some of the income comes from Christian unions and right now the Christian unions are home. We don't know when schools will resume. And it's a hard time. They still have to pay their bills, their rents, the, the salaries of the staff. And I feel compelled to, to give and to keep on giving because as an associate, I'm also expected to keep on giving towards that ministry. And I am realizing that more than ever, they need our support right now. But it's the same case with the servants of God. We don't have the regular offerings and uh, we don't have the regular tithes that we collect every Sunday right now because many people, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, as long as I'm not in church, I'm not giving. But it's a time to keep on serving, to keep on standing with the servants of God, to keep on serving and to keep on giving towards the work of God because the work of God is still continuing. The work of God is still continuing. The families are still being fed. And it's a time for us to remember that the Shunammite woman, served and kept on serving even after she had received her miracle the first time the son she still kept on serving the servant of god and today the lord is calling us to a continued service the lord is calling us to a continued giving to his work the lord is calling us to a continued giving to those who i need to those who need us more than ever before right now the Lord is calling us to reach out to those people who still have to pay rent, yet their kinyoses, their salons have been closed. The Lord is still calling out to reach out to those people who used to go to Darajambili. They can no longer do that because the market has been closed. The Lord is calling us to look out to the most vulnerable of our brothers. The